Again, really good to be with you, both those of you in the room, those of you joining online. Thank you for uh, the gift of your presence. Over the next handful of weeks, what I hope to do, uh, what I believe Jesus is inviting us into, is an opportunity to be helped in standing firm and at the same time loving well in times that are divided and divisive and hostile and uncertain. My hope and my prayer really is that you and I both and us together truly will be helped and standing firm while simultaneously loving well. Two things that in divided, divisive, uncertain times can feel like they are pitted in opposition against one another. I hope you are helped, I am helped, we're helped together. I want to give you a few words that you might fairly easily start associating with times like that. Words like war, words like assassination attempts, words like political scandal, I'll stop there. We could name more, right? We could name more. We could use words and phrases like conspiracy and or conspiracy theory. We can use words or phrases like sexual perversion. We can use phrases like skepticism, abuse of power. We could use all sorts of phrases. that might for us characterize divided, divisive, uncertain, chaotic times. Now, I wonder what you think when you hear those words. They sound, they sound relatable right now, don't they? I mean, doesn't it feel like right, right, right now? I just want you to know when I'm, when I'm using them in this moment, uh, I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking more about the 1970s. Thinking more about, just for the moment, Vietnam War. Where American soldiers were drafted into the war, where the war chose them before they chose it many times. And out of all lack of reason, when those same young men who didn't choose a war but the war chose them came home, they were ridiculed, mocked, condemned, disgraced. It's West Michigan. Some of you may be pretty familiar with this. It was also in the 1970s that President Ford had two attempts on his life in a span of 17 days. It's not just... That's not unique to the 70s or now. 60s, of course, we have the assassination of JFK. In the 80s, we have the attempt on Ronald Reagan, 2005, on George W. Bush. I mean, right, it's... And that's just the presidents. That's not counting people who were cultural influencers or investors that didn't have the title of president, Martin Luther King Jr. And, of course, we get the the wonder and the glamour that is Watergate. 
maybe the time that as much as any other drives the stake in the ground that says we don't really trust the government, right? It just, whoa, what, what is going on here, right? I say all that to simply say this. Every generation, every generation reaches their own difficult period of crisis and in that moment, it's very easy to look back as if back was the good old days, as if back was perfectly colorful and painted all inside the lines, and all the boundaries were kept, and everybody got along in euphoria, right? Right? Not true. There may be a generation one day, in fact, there probably will be a generation one day that looks back on our moment today and says, man, those were the good old days. It simply means this. The gift to us in this moment is that we are not the first. We are not the first to live in divided, hostile, chaotic, uncertain times. And while we will not minimize the times that we are in because they are of vital importance, but what we can recognize is because we're not the first, there, there are some lessons already shaped that can enable us to live standing firm and loving well. We're not the first to need to do it. We're not the first that will pull it off. There are some ways forward for us. There really is hope. It really is possible for you and me and us together to be helped in this path of this way forward of figuring out how to, how to live standing firm and loving well in the times that we find ourselves in. One of them is just on occasion taking the opportunity to enjoy a moment of levity. And so while the 70s were marked by all of that tragedy and turmoil, I would like to just Note to you that it was also a time of what now could only be viewed as tragic fashion. <laughs> okay? I mean, do we, any of us really want to see this again? Really? <laughs> do any of us really want to see the leisure suit again? I am concerned that it may come back. Uh, when I see my girls who are 20 wear things that my grandma and my mom used to wear, I think the leisure suit may have a fighting chance, okay? But let's go past the 70s. I want to take you to 605 B.C., so 2,600 plus years ago now. 605 B.C., um, we get these Jewish people who are in unbelievable turmoil. It, to be quite honest, it, we, we don't want to compare all of the time, but to be quite honest, their turmoil was worse than ours, more significant than, than ours. Um, and to find their story, I want to invite you to go to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel is this chronicle of events that we have in the Old Testament of your Bible. If you want to jump into a table of contents and see Daniel, that's, that's great. It's, a, it's a really helpful, and it's an okay way to get there. Daniel chapter 1 is, is where we're going to start today. And the story really is about a guy named Daniel, but, but he is one of a group of Jewish people. And here's the, the tension that Daniel finds himself in, is that he uh, is following a generation of Jewish people in the land of Judah uh, who really were completely disobedient uh, to God, the God who made them and the God who wanted to lead them. And it's a gradual move that, that starts with some, with some drift. They, they start just drifting from God a little bit. They find themselves gradually getting a little less aware of God and who he is, right? They, and then that drift leads to what we might call disregard. They drift a little bit, and once they drift a little bit, it's a little easier easier to disregard some of God's commands and his ways. It's a little bit easier to look at God's guardrails for their relationship and view them as a little, oh, irrelevant and out of date and not quite keeping up with the rest of the cultures around them. That, that drift that leads to a disregard then opens them up fairly easily to just the disdain for God. They just don't need God. They don't want anything to do with God. 
Maybe they would try and keep God as a little bit of a tag on, a little bit of a label, a little bit of a tattoo to the culture to maybe hope they could be identified with him. And you and I, we, we're vulnerable to the same movement, by the way. It's easy to drift from God. You don't have to do anything to drift from God. You just kind of got to be, and you'll, drift is the most natural thing. But I think it's really easy to disregard God, to start measuring his commands and picking and choosing which ones we would like. And to be honest, this is largely where what we identify as the Western church, this is largely where most of us are and we don't even know it. You can write that one down and like think about it later. But we have disregard. We like love God. We might even show up in environments like this, but we take his commands and we pick and choose and we hope he knows our heart, which is actually deceitful above all things. And so we're confused by trusting our heart, but we take disregard. We don't like it. It doesn't fit the culture. And then we just really get kind of a disdain for God long before we admit a disdain for God. And so while it was true for the Jewish people in 605 and the years before that, it is also a vulnerability for us. Vulnerability for us. In the middle of that, there's this guy named Daniel, and Daniel is part of the generation in Judah who uh, is going to be taken captive. You see, because of this drift, disregard, and disdain, what has happened is God has had to take his hand of blessing off his people. Like he's like, Man, I I can't bless that. It's like when you're a kid or when you are the kid and you keep going into the road after your parents say no, or you keep talking back after your parents ask you not to, well, guess what? You don't get candy or you don't get to go out or you do lose your foot, right? There's a removal of this hand of blessing or, right, sometimes even beyond that, and this is God in this moment, sometimes there actually is a loving expression of discipline, which is a little foreign to our culture today, but there's this loving display of discipline where God has to say, look, I love you enough to say, I don't want to just let you continually recklessly live outside of the the parameters I've designed for our relationship, outside the covenant I've designed for our relationship. Like I can't bless that and I want to protect you from future harm. And so part of the discipline is that the people of Judah will, they're literally overrun. They're just beaten down. They are taken captive, some of them by the king and leader of Babylonia. And that's where we're going to pick it up because Daniel's a young man and he's got some friends and this is part of their story. Daniel chapter 1. So 605-ish BC. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, he's the king of Babylon at the time, he came to Jerusalem, he just besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These Nebuchadnezzar carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and he put in the treasure house of God. Okay, see, we've, we've gone beyond just no blessing and we're in the discipline place, phase. It's difficult. They've just... They've gotten to the point of disregard and disdain for God and God's like, I gotta try and get your attention and, and get it back. Verse three, then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of his court officials, his second in command, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, sounds a little like your pastor, okay? I didn't even, it was not funny. showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, that just proved it wasn't actually your pastor, right there, okay, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Now, check this out, last line of verse four. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Language and literature, language and literature, language and literature. Language, listen, language sets culture, If you want to know the culture of your home, listen to your language. If you want to know the culture of your life, listen to the language. If you want to know the culture of your school or your team or your class or your office, listen to the language. Language determines culture. So what 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 Ashpenaz is trying to do here by like helping them learn the Babylonian language is not just teach them a new language, like a new dialect, not just teach them, hey, I know English, I want to teach you Spanish or I want to teach you Mandarin or something like that. He's literally trying to change the vocabulary to change points of definition. And we're living in that. We've been living in that for the last several years. Let me give you a let me give you two examples. Let me give you two examples. 
One is the word safe. It's the word safe. It's a good word. It's a good word. One of our girls went back, was home for the weekend for a fall break, went back to school last night. I prayed that she would be safe on the way. It's a good word. It's a good word. Until, until it became a word that meant the avoidance of any and all pain and any and all difficulty. Until it meant, until it meant I will draw a barrier around my life and I will label you unsafe, not if you harm me, but if you disagree with me. And all of the sudden, right, we all use the word safe, but do you hear the morphine of the definition? We're in that, that's the battle, right? And what happens when the definition morphs enough and it gets to a big enough part of, the, part of people, the population? The culture shifts. That's just, that's just one word. The, the language, and then he also says the literature. I'm going to change their literature. I'm, I'm going to change what they read because if I can change what they read, part of what I will change is what they view as sacred. So for us, like if, if you're here and you're a Jesus follower, you wonder like, what do these people of Jesus followers do? Well, our, we want to base our life on the person of Jesus and our greatest exposure to the person of Jesus is through his scriptures so, so what happens? What happens? Well, this is where drift that leads to disregard gets us in trouble. The culture begins to say, now wait a second, now wait a second, if you, if you take the scriptures, you don't like, you, you don't really, you don't really like want to let them be the anchor. What you want to be the anchor is your truth. And then inside of church circles, we got really uncomfortable with, with your truth. We're like, ooh, that feels a little bit idolatrous or something. So instead, we just said, I want my comforts. I want my, I want, I want my comforts. And then what we started to do, like it's super gradual, what? Which they ch we changed our relationship and we started to, we started to compartmentalize. We started to pick and choose. We started to, to choose which parts of the scripture were actually for us and which were not for us. And which parts we knew better than the God who actually wrote the scripture. Okay, what, what, what's happening? There's a shift in the language. There's a shift in how we view the literature. Now, now listen, please hear me on this. Please hear me on this. Most of us in a room or online in a setting like this think, oh, it's tragic. That's tragic. And it is. And you are more vulnerable than you think. And if we too easily let the language change our understanding and engagement in the culture, and if we too easily let what God designed to be sacred be even the slightest bit diluted, we will not stand firm and love well. We will not stand firm and love well. We will pick standing firm or loving well. We will pick one. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot, of, there's a lot at stake. Huh? Got to be careful. Can I give you one more? Thanks for the six of you that are in. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> we, we've. Uh, how, how many of you are just kind of done with the word cancel? Just all, well, done with that, right? Right. For, for the rest of you that are not bold enough to raise your hand, I cancel you in the name. No, I don't. Never mind. No, that's not true. I don't. I didn't mean it. Okay. But you're saying we we got really like we we got really nervous about this word cancel. We don't like cancel culture. We don't like it. Right. But, but yet, here's, here's what happened. The language became so the, pervasive, and we, we reacted to that. We came out of that. And, and you know what happens when you're not careful? As you react so strongly to a language, you be actually become part of the language you're reacting to. We're so averse to cancel that we started to cancel. Right? We're so averse to intolerance that we became intolerant. Y'all with me? 
I know it's uncomfortable, but come on, somebody. I mean, we got to figure this out, okay? I, I was just reading the other day some research by sociologists who are writing about the canceling, what they call the canceling of the American mind or the American way of thinking, like just the way to think, like the ability to think and think clearly and think critically. And what's fascinating is the stats they unpack that talk about the, the, the predominance of canceling on college campuses that lean left. And on college campuses that lean right. It's hard to stand firm and love well when the thing you are trying to resist is the thing you become. My pastor sure doesn't have any aptitude for this. I mean, that isn't bad. Come on, let's, get, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were entered into the king's service. I want you to hear this too, three years. This is not instantaneous. The reason most of us are having trouble standing firm and loving well is because the movement, the push against it is gradual. It's over the course of time. Nobody came to you one day, knocked on your door and said, hey, I'm just part of a public announcement. We'd like to hate each other. <laughs> Nobody did that, right? It's gradual. It's a, it's a, it's a move, right? And a lot, of, a lot of the most vocal participants don't even really understand what they're part of, Okay. Verse 6, among those who were chosen from Judah, here's our guy, Daniel, and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief official, he gave them, say these next two words with me, he gave them what? He gave them what? Come on, even online, he gave them what? He gave them new names, man. Listen, names, that's how we start identifying each other. That's how we identify people, right? When I say your name, if you and I know each other, when I say your name, without even thinking about it, I have a whole filter my, body, my mind goes through about who I know you to be. If somebody says my name to you, you've got a whole grid that in a millisecond, your mind and your heart go through that, that, how you see who I am. You, you don't, when, when somebody says, well, that's John, you don't think, oh, yeah, I see the J, I see the O, like, that's how you, you think about what, what you view as the substance of who I am. And so if we can give new names, if we can give new names, man, we can mess with some things. If we, <laughs> if we can give new names, we can, like, change an entire identity. Look at, look at the dude, Daniel and his, and his friends. Let's just check this out here for a second. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, he gave Shadrach. To Mishael, he gave Meshach. And to Azariah, he gave Abednego. You, you might know those names more true, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, we don't have time to go through all those, but I do want to tell you Daniel's shift because it's a little window into the others. Uh, Daniel, his original name, Daniel, meant God is my judge. God is my judge. His original name, Daniel, was like big on God. God is big. God is my judge. God could be trusted. God is the one that is the compass. God is the one that can discipline. God is like God's the center. God's my judge. Okay, I need, I need God's direction of me. Do you see that? God's my judge. Now, when Ashpenaz gave Daniel a new name, he said, I'm going to give you the name Belteshazzar, which means lady, protect the king. I want you to see two things that happen. One, one, they're changing what's sacred. You, you need to protect the king. Your king's not that. You, you need to, you, you've changed roles here. And two, yeah, it is an attempt. It is an attempt to change Daniel's labeled gender. That is part of the attempt. You can look at every pagan, God-resistant culture throughout history. This is part of the equation. The, where the world starts messing with sexuality, 
and identity, the understanding of identity, they sow and then foster confusion and chaos. And when you get enough confusion and chaos, what do you get? You start to change your vocabulary. You start to have groups canceling. You start, you see it building. Do you see it building? Okay. The, so, like, that's what I'm trying to say. The moment we're living in is not all that new. Okay, it's not all that new to us. For those of you who lived in the 70s, do you, do you remember how people thought they were going to get enlightenment? Sex and drugs. Right? I mean, you can never, but right? Some of you don't want to nod that you were actually alive in the 70s. I get it, but, but okay, but it's, it's fine. It's, but it's fine, but, it's, but you know I'm right, okay? So here's what you've got. You've got literally them saying, Daniel, we're going to change your name. Nobody's changed the name on your driver's license. But it is possible that they change the names or words that you think of or that are thought of when we as Jesus followers and we as a culture talk about God's church. And if we're not careful, this was the risk for Daniel. This is part of why Daniel is such a great example because Daniel does not give in to this. But if you get a new name and it's pushed enough, what happens? It gets easy to subtly let your identity and your core be changed. We could go back 20 years, 25 years, and there were subtleties emerging. Subtleties. Uh, the church Christians are dangerous, harmful, oppressive, abusive. Okay, it was, it was subtle at first. Picked up pace about 10 years ago. I mean, it just, you, it just started feeling, okay? You, you want to know what the, the risk of that was for us, the people at church? Again, Jesus fell. It, is that we reacted so strongly to it that in many cases, we became it. We acted so strongly in opposition to it that in our opposition, sometimes, candidly, we did get dangerous. We did get hurtful. We did get really condemning. We really did get quickly judgmental. We did so much damage to ourselves that, candidly, it's embarrassing. We're not the first. Like, let's look back through history. We've got... Christians on crusades, thousands of years. I mean, right, we're not first, right? But can I just, can, can, we, like, can we just be okay acknowledging that we've, we, we've given into this a little bit? Almost unknowingly. Again, nobody knocked on the door of the church and said, okay, look, I got a few hundred of you here. From today forward, we're gonna be jerks. Nobody did, like, nobody's doing that, right? But it got easy because we felt a little threatened or we got a little defensive or we got a little, and listen, listen, as long as we're defensive, as long as we're quickly defensive, we will not love well and stand firm. We will pick one. We will pick one. We will pick one. Who's naming you? Right now, in this moment, who's naming you? Somebody's naming you. Who, who's naming you? The God of all creation who created you out of this abundance and overflow of love is the only one actually worthy of naming you. The creator is the only one worthy to do the naming. 
Okay, the creator is the only one worthy to do the naming. Who's naming you? If we do not consider who is naming us, the culture is naming us. If we do not consider who is naming us, the culture is naming us. Subtly and very, very small, little microbites. That's why later in the New Testament Bible, this guy Paul says, man, don't conform, don't conform, don't conform, don't conform to the pattern of the world, this gradual ticking of renaming you. We, we, we look at Daniel and we watch this new name and we see it play out and we see that he's in it and there's all this new language coming and there's all this like, you see all the tension that like he's living with in this, in this moment, right? And the, we have to understand the only, the only way to stand firm, the only way to stand firm and to love well is to be convinced about who's naming us. Listen, if, if we allow God to name us, if we embrace who he says we are, and we live a life of embracing who he says we are in an ongoing way, allowing it to be more and more rooted all the time, do you know what is not needed? We don't need to be defensive because that's a sure thing. When the creator has named us, we don't have to be defensive. We don't have to try and protect that. It is protected by the creator. It is given to us. We didn't earn it. We didn't build it. We received it. We became transformed into it. When the culture names us, when the culture names us, it is by nature, it's by nature susceptible and weak because listen, because the culture, because the culture doesn't have the ultimate authority to name us, it doesn't have the creative right to name us, and so when it does, it has inherent weaknesses. Which is why when we let the culture name us, we start to get defensive. We start to cancel other people. We start to get a little more intolerant even while we talk about being tolerant. Why is that? Because there's something in us that knows this is not stable. This is not secure. Who's naming you? Who's, who's naming us? Who's naming us? Who's naming us? Even as, even as the church, like this body of Jesus, is these people of Jesus, who's naming us? Are we letting Jesus and his model and his dream for his church, his characteristics of his church name us? Or are we letting the culture, by taking cultural language and trying to shove it back in over here, which is where we get consumerism of the church, which is where we get critical spirit, which is where we get division and divisiveness. Who's naming us? Who's naming us? When everything else is chaotic, when everything else is uncertain, if we can settle in on a certainty of who has named us and what he has named us, if we can level, level, settle in on a certainty of who the God who created us has named us, man, that is the, that is the certainty that we need to not just resist a culture, but to influence a culture. To stand firm in who that is, and then because it is given by a loving creator, we will love well. We will love well. It's, it's, it's hard to love well when we're not standing firm. Who's naming you? Who's naming you? I know you, I, so many of you, I know you know the right answer. I know in a very cerebral way, you know the right answer. But who's naming you, really? Who's naming you? Let's, let's, let's keep reading. We've got to keep going. we got to keep going. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved. Just say that word, resolved. 
He resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. So there's all this chief official, and he's got Nebuchadnezzar's food, right? And he wants them to eat it. But Daniel knows two things. Number one, he knows that just very spiritually speaking, that food's not clean. It's been sacrificed to idols. It's for another purpose, right? He knows, like, I, I, I don't want any part of that. He's going to, like, suggest a, a different idea of what he would like to eat. And as we play this out a little bit, what you'll see is that Daniel doesn't try and manipulate. He doesn't engage in an argument. He doesn't engage in negotiation. But he is resolved to do everything in his power to stand firm in the identity of the one who created him and gave an identity. And while he is standing firm in that, do you know how he is able to stand firm? He is able to stand firm in a way that loves well even an uncertain, perilous times in a foreign land with foreign leaders who are bent on changing the course of his life, his thoughts, his actions. Daniel resolved. He just said, this is who I am, this is whose I am, this is who I am, and this is whose I am. And when I understand that who I am because of whose I am, then I can resolve to just stay with him, whatever that means and whatever that brings. Some of you have read into this story and you know there's some good, but listen, Daniel didn't know that. Daniel's in the moment. Daniel's in the moment. For all Daniel knows, his life is gone tomorrow. By merely asking the question, his life could have been over. But he's resolved. And listen, when we are resolved, when we are resolved to live who we are because of whose we are, we do a much better job of responding to what life brings us, responding to what the culture brings us. We do a much better job of moving with wisdom and deliberate intentionality and with purpose and with some clarity. And now let me play out a really subtle distinction for you. Responding responding plus resolving. When you take this resolving piece, we've resolved that this is who we are and whose we are, and it sets us up to live responding. That is always greater than simply reacting. That's always greater than simply reacting. Listen, listen to me. Reacting, in the current culture of our day, in our time of life, reacting is quick, it's instantaneous, it's emotionally driven, and it's always sparked by something. And when we react without, without either having established our resolve and what our resolve is in and who our resolve is in, which sets us up to respond slowly and with deliberation and out of love with a firmness in who we are, when we react only, that's when we find ourselves too quickly defensive too quickly canceling, judging, pushing against, resisting, unaware of what God might be doing in the moment. Reacting is is what we do when we hear a snippet or we read a headline or we see a post and the instant reaction is anger or deep depression or despair or lashing out or loss of hope. And you may not, like you you might know this, or you maybe have not realized it yet, but listen, friends, your reaction, we'll talk about this more in other contexts in this series, but your your, your reactivity, your, your just quickness to react, our quickness to react, there are literally billions of dollars in our economy spent on getting you and I to react to things. Your reaction has been monetized. There are people making tens of millions of dollars a year to get you to react. There are algorithms who people have spent years formulating to get you to react. There are church environments and there are pastors who will take a truth and use it and manipulate it in a way to get you to react. Let's not just throw all the stones out there somewhere.
likely the news you watch or the source you read, it is programmed and it is, it is paid for by money used to get you to react. To get you to embrace or to hate a language or a cultural language so much so and react to it so quickly that you actually become part of the language. Daniel has resolved in the middle of being given a new name, somebody making him learn a new language, somebody making him new, learn, new, learn new literature, adjust to their customs, trying to force them to adjust to their food. It's like, ah, as far as it depends on me, there are some things I've resolved to because I know whose I am, and because I know whose I am, I know who I am. Are you reacting, or are we allowing ourselves the gift of responding out of our resolve? We okay? Okay, good. The rest of you will be in a little bit. Don't worry. Now, verse 9. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Come on, if you resolve, everything may not go your way, but God will give you favor. Sometimes that favor is just the strength of you. Sometimes that favor is the gift of other people who should be opposed to you, wanting to help you, which it is in, in Daniel's case. Favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, man, I'm afraid, I can't, I'm afraid of the Lord my king, Nebuchadnezzar. You saw what he did to your nation. He's assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for just 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables. Man, you gotta be resolved for this thing, man, right? Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, <laughs> they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Hmm. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. See, he's resolved. He knows who he is. He knows who he is, and that is resulting and him having supernatural gifting for the crisis he finds himself in. Supernatural gifting in the uncertainty he finds himself in. Now, I just want you to listen to something. I just want you to listen to verse 20. I'm not even going to put it in front of you. Just listen to this. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, Daniel and his friends, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. What? Listen, listen. He found them 10 times better, and it has nothing to do with fruits and vegetables. Nothing. Nothing. You should still eat yours, okay? But it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with this reality that Daniel was resolved to know who he was and who he was. Daniel was, Daniel was resolved. If Daniel wasn't resolved, if Daniel was trying to form an identity or letting somebody else give him, he could have eaten all the fruits and vegetables he wanted and not been 10 times better. Listen to me. Now, listen, don't, don't, could, couldn't we use in our world and all the division and all the divisiveness, couldn't we use some people? Couldn't we use a movement of people? Couldn't the world use the church that is 10 times better at standing firm while also loving well? and loving well out of people who stand firm and not people who think stand firm and hide behind truth with no grace and are just lobbing truth out with no compassion and no love to it and not just people who are taking love and out of so much fear of the truth might be causing hurt and pain, just adopting and morphing love and taking it to mean something different. Couldn't the world use a movement of people who are 10 times better at both qualities? It starts with, it starts with our resolve, are we resolved to be who the one who made us said we are? His children, his loved children, his strengthened children, his chosen children, his adopted children. Children he's proud of, excited about, fully present with. We gotta ask a question. And then over the course of the next week or so, I hope you 
We'll answer the question with two little sub-questions to, to help it a little bit. Here, here's, here's, the, here's the big overarching question. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus or you're joining on and you're a follower of Jesus, this is the question we have to ask in our, in our day. Is the culture changing us or are we changing the world? Is the culture changing us or are we changing the world? Please hear what I'm not asking. I'm not asking, are we changing the world by making sure we protect all of our rights and conveniences and comforts and preferences? Daniel had none of those, friends, none, none, okay? Are we letting the culture change us or are we changing the world? Now, let me give you a couple questions. You, gotta, you, you just got to work on these during the week a little bit, okay? You can't answer these in 20 seconds in this, in this moment. But here's the first one. Who's naming me? Who's naming me? Man, this is a breakfast conversation or a dinner conversation or a car windshield conversation. This is, I mean, this is a, this is a journal question. This is a you and the Lord question. This is a family question, a parent child question. I mean, we just got to talk about them, right? This is a small group question. Who really is naming me? Based on the way I live, who is naming me? Based on what I do with my thoughts and emotions, who's naming me? Based on the way I view life, who's naming me? Based on the way I view eternity, who's naming me? Who's naming me? Based on how sacrificial I am, who's naming me? Who's naming me? Here's the second question. What do our reactions or responses say about the size of our God? What do our reactions or responses say about the size of our God? What do the reactions or responses of our life say about the size of our God? Quick, harsh, hateful, protective, defensive, paranoid, panicked, hate-filled, despair-filled reactions. We don't, we don't know it and we don't like to think it, but they convey we got a real small God that's smaller than the culture and smaller than the trend, and smaller than the movement. Man, I don't want that kind of God. I don't want that kind of God. What are our reactions or responses saying about the size of our God? We're gonna follow the story of Daniel a little more and his friends, and some of you will know some of the high points of the story along the way, and you can read ahead if you want. It's, it really is exciting. There's so much beyond just the, the outward events that we're going to uncover in the next several weeks. But we can learn a lot about how they respond and how they don't react. We can learn a lot about standing firm and loving well based on how we see their resolve played out and their choices, the way they treat people, and again, the way they respond not react. So I want to leave you with those questions just to set the pace of where we're going. Questions, again, can't answer in 20 seconds. I know we love, I know we love to come to church and say, man, give me, give me like two points. I'll go do them. I'll go do them. I gave you two questions. Go think about them. <laughs> we got we to gotta go think. We got to go pray. We got to listen.